I'm going to talk to you about memory hacking. Um, there it is. Um, my name is Julia Sean. I'm a memory scientist, and I mess with people's brains. And to start talking with, about that, to, before I begin to take you on an incredible journey, I like to think, uh, through the fascinating world of memory science and manipulating memories in particular, I need you to do something for me. So the first thing I need you to do for me is to picture a world where you don't have any memories. You don't recognize your family. You don't remember your life. You don't remember the things you've said, the things you've done, the things you've learned. Nothing. Now the question I have for you is this memoryless person, is this person still you? Because I think a lot of you probably are thinking that maybe if I didn't have all these memories, if I didn't know who I was essentially, that I couldn't be the same person. And that's what fascinates me. The intersection of memory and identity, the memories that make us who we are. These are called autobiographical memories. They're the memories of our lives. And that's what I study. And what I want to do is I want to start by talking about what a memory actually is before we can understand how maybe a scenario like that where memories are all gone is not impossible, but even less impossible is perhaps a reality where your memories are slightly different than the things you actually experience. And sometimes people like me can come in and completely change your memories entirely. So what is a memory? What is a memory? What does a memory look like? We can, we can describe a memory. We can feel memories. We can, we can talk about them. But memory is a network. A memory is a network in the brain. And in particular, in order to understand how memory works, we need to understand something called spreading activation. Spreading activation means that when you look for a memory, what you're doing is you're sending out a little probe into your brain that ripples out throughout lots of different parts of the brain. And that network, that network is what we're accessing when we remember something. It's also the network that we're creating when we're experiencing or thinking about something and trying to make it into a memory. So memory is a network. And what's critical to understand about this network is that it's like a galaxy. Your brain is like a galaxy, and these networks are like stars that are constantly moving. Everything is constantly in motion. And the connections between stars that make this network, that make a memory, can easily be distorted. They can be broken. If you break connections between parts of this memory, we call that forgetting. Right? You forget a detail. You've broken a connection in the brain. You add a detail. Maybe you're talking to someone, and they give you a detail, and you go, oh, yeah, I think I remember that. And maybe you've added a piece. So that network is incredibly malleable, is incredibly flexible, and is changing all the time. So as a social psychologist, which is what I do, I utilize this information. I utilize the fact that memory is a network that can be messed with, that is constantly changing anyways. And I say, well, how about I use social situations to actively distort memories. Because memory really is a social construction. And what we find is that we can create memories just by talking to people. We can share a story. We're talking to friends. We're talking to family. Mom says something about your childhood. You don't remember that right away, but with enough imagination, even you can remember being born or being in your crib or something else exceptional that maybe going into the conversation you had no idea what they were talking about. Maybe they even gave you a picture. Now in those kinds of situations, what they're doing is they're potentially, well, maybe giving you memories that are true that you just don't remember. So events, situations that actually happened, but you just couldn't initially remember them. But maybe sometimes they get it wrong, right? Sometimes family and friends also don't remember everything. And sometimes family and friends tell us we did things that never actually happened. That didn't happen to you. Perhaps it happened to your sibling. Perhaps it happened to some totally different person. Or maybe they're just making a mistake. And so in these kinds of situations, we can see that we, people can give us their memories, but we can also take them. And so every time we have a situation where we're sharing a memory with somebody else, what we find is that we're all memory thieves is that we're stealing pieces here and there. And they're being woven into this network, this network that is a memory. And it's changing shape every time. 
Now, here's a question. When we talk about identity and memory in these kinds of constructs, there's sort of this assumption that maybe we recognize our own memories. You certainly would hope so, right? That you, I'd know my memories. If I write down a story about something I saw, and then I look at it later, I can tell whether I wrote that or whether somebody else wrote that down, right? So you'd recognize your own stories. You'd recognize your own diary. You'd recognize your own journal entries. But science says that you might not. That if you write a journal entry about what happened in a day or during an event, and you give that journal entry to me, and I change a couple things. Let's say I, I erase some of the details and I write something else in. Maybe it was a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday. Little details. Most of you won't recognize that I've made these changes when I give that journal entry back to you. You won't even notice it's happened. You might even start describing the wrong day in accordance with what I just told you, which was wrong. But even more so, science says, I can erase most of it, rewrite it, and some of you won't notice that I've done it. And some of you will tell me about, in more elaborate detail, the event, again, that never actually happened the way that it was originally remembered, or the way it was originally experienced. So you wouldn't even recognize your own memories. This is so bad that you probably wouldn't even recognize your own face. Now, we've done this study, and by me, I mean memory scientists, have done a study where they've photoshopped pictures. So they've taken pictures of adults. So your parents, let's talk about your parents. Your parents don't know how, what they look like. You might know this, but they don't. Um, so to the parents in the room, if I took a picture of you right now and I photoshopped it in 5% increments to be more attractive or less attractive than you actually are, and I give you the task, so I take a picture of you now, photoshop it while you go away, you come back. I put these photos in front of you. What do you think you're going to pick? Turns out you're going to pick one that's about 15% more attractive than you actually are. <laughs> now, why? Why don't we even recognize pictures of ourselves? A Our face is probably a pretty key thing that we look at every day. Memory science suggests, well, possibly because we've, quote, hacked our own memories. So I said that you can steal pieces of memories from other people in, in storytelling, in, in, you know, when your family and friends share details with you or when you share details with them. But you can also hack your memory by doing things like posting selectively on social media. By every time you post a picture of yourself, only taking the best ones, the ones you print out and put on the wall. They're your favorite pictures. They're the ones that are probably, well, about 15% more attractive than you actually are. And so when you think about your face, what you're accessing is a memory of all of those different photos merged into one, which gives you a distorted or hacked, or what we call a false, memory of what you look like right now. So unfortunately, the mirror might be accurate, but your memory is not. So why? The biggest thing that I do in my studies where I convince people that they committed crimes even that never happened, where I implant complex autobiographical false memories, whole events, people like me convince people that they've had hot air balloon rides that they never had that they shook hands with Bugs Bunny at Disneyland, which is impossible because, as you know, Bugs Bunny's not a Disney character. Um, so that, they, that they had tea with Prince Charles. That they got attacked by an animal that they nearly drowned, that they were at weddings that they were, they, they were never at. Or like me, that they maybe committed a crime that they didn't commit. And the reason we can do this is because what we do in our studies is we repeatedly get people to picture the event as it could have been. You come into my lab, you think I know stuff about you that you don't remember. I tell you I have a solution, let's repeatedly picture the event and hopefully it'll come back. Now if you repeatedly over a couple of weeks picture what you think could have happened and I go, good, looks like the details are coming back, I'm giving you confidence, what happens is it's really easy for you later on to think when you're accessing your imagination that what you're actually accessing is your memory. So what we're finding is that imagination and memory can be incredibly easily mixed up. And this is particularly true when we talk about what are called multi-sensory memories. Now multi-sensory memories are memories where we can hear things, feel things, taste things, touch things. They're memories that are networks that are across much of the brain. That's why you can do all these, feel and hear and perceive all these different things in these memories. 
But the thing is, usually our imagination, if you just think about something as it could be, you have a thought, usually you don't have things that you heard and felt and, and thought and said. You just have the, the one idea. You just have a picture. But if I get you to picture in all its complexity what it could have felt like, what it could have sounded like, what it could have smelt like, well, suddenly your brain can't tell the difference. Because as it turns out, your imagination in the brain looks exactly the same. So it's the same kind of process. So as I said, in mine, what this culminates in, what this leads to understanding is that people like police officers can actually lead you down a path where they get you to confess to something that you didn't do. And so just by asking leading questions, just by suggesting to you, you were the guy, I know you did it, right? I know you did it, I know it was you. You can get people to incriminate themselves, to say in vivid and complex and multi-sensory detail that they committed a crime, what the crime was, why they did it, and what happened after. Now, for some of the people in the room, hopefully that sends some shivers down your spine, as it should, because this means that we need to be really careful about memories and this flexible process within the criminal justice system. In courtrooms, unlike at home, when you're talking to your family and friends about memories, maybe it doesn't totally matter what exactly happened. Maybe it doesn't matter that you were wearing a blue jacket or a green jacket that it happened on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. But in a courtroom, that does matter. In a courtroom, getting those details wrong can put innocent people in jail. And that's where my work goes, is I go into courts and I apply the science of memory, and false memory in particular, to educating police officers, to educating the military, to educating people on how to not accidentally convince people that they did things that never happened. The other thing that this kind of information can lead you to, understanding the complexity of the brain, understanding that imagination and memory are easy to mix up, is it can quite easily lead you to an existential crisis. Because essentially, research like this suggests that even though you say something or remember something with confidence, with complexity, with lots of different emotions, it doesn't necessarily mean that it happened. And that's true for anything. That's true for your most cherished memories, for your childhood, for something that happened yesterday. Your, no memory is safe from corruption. And so, accordingly, it should lead you to wonder, well, who am I? What does that mean for my identity? Do I even know or remember my own life? And the answer to that is no, you don't. Uh, but that's OK because we're going to talk about the future of memory hacking and why this is a good thing. So the, re the biggest thing why it's OK that you don't exactly remember every single detail of your life is because, for one, you don't need to most of the time. So your, your brain is pretty good at optimizing things. Uh, and this is, this is no different. The other thing is the creative connections in the brain are the same things that are responsible for, well, false memories on the one hand, so thinking things happened that didn't, but also by being able to reconnect things in the brain in those networks, we get things like creativity, intelligence, problem solving. We can connect things in ways that didn't actually happen, and that's really important to make us who we are, to make us human. And in the future of memory hacking, hopefully what this will lead us to is being able to do things like delete and replace memories. For people who have experienced highly emotional negative events, Maybe they've experienced something traumatic that they'd rather forget. There's research being done right now that's trying to apply the same science to not just implanting, well, the kinds of memories that I implant of committing crime, but also taking stuff away and changing it for the better so that people can heal and, and well, harness their brains in a better way. So maybe we'll be able to delete. And, and there is some suggestion that we're already doing this in, in mice, for example. Picking a past, it also encourages us to, well, if you know that none of your autobiographical memories can be trusted, how about you just decide, if you're unsure about a particular situation, which version you like better? Essentially, it gets you to pick and choose the pieces that work for you right now, because you're reinterpreting your past every single time anyways. And a lot of fiction is already woven in there. 
it even, given that there are a lot of teenagers in the audience, um, some of you are probably still thinking about your identity. Who am I? What is my role in the world? And this also encourages you to say, well, maybe I can pick an identity. Because every single day, I wake up with a new brain. I wake up with new memories. And that means that I can decide every single day when I wake up who I want to be that day and who I want to be in the future. Because it essentially says the past is mostly fiction. So it's a really good idea to try and live in the past, in the present, and like, think about the future. So what I'm going to leave you with is three pieces of advice. The first is to be cautious. If it's important to remember something, specifically to remember the details of a memory or an event, think about, well, where did this come from? Be cautious. Just because I'm really confident, you can say to yourself, I should still look for other evidence that this thing actually happened. Be curious. Think about other people. Other people are getting things wrong, potentially. Ask about how they remembered. Ask about how police maybe interrogated them in an investigation. And be kind. Just because someone says something that's demonstrably untrue, don't assume that they're lying. They might just have a false memory. And the next time somebody says, remember, remember the 5th of November, you can say to them, or do you? <laughs> Thank you.